Okay, here we go for part two. Sonship. The concept of sonship prior to the incarnation is more commonly known as the eternal son doctrine of Roman Catholicism, which comes from the Greek mystical theology of Neoplatonism, which teaches that the universe sent forth a thought, which they referred to it as being Logos, Word of God, and in turn, this Logos, according to them, created all the material universe and was declared to be begotten, yet not created. Since according to this theological mess, the Logos proceeded from the universe as a thought, yet it wasn't created. Whereas the true biblical teaching of the Logos is quite clear. In beginning, the word equals Logos was with God, alongside God, and was God. The biblical concept of the Logos is totally at odds with the occult teaching of Neoplatonism. The early Catholic Church fathers borrowed heavily from Philo of Alexandria. What the early church fathers did was basically relabel the universe as God, the Father, and the Logos, he thought, as God the Son, and the female principle, the Holy Spirit. While the latter is not apparently clear as in reference to the Holy Spirit and the role that Mary plays, the underlying occult teaching of the Kabbalah does reveal that Bina or wisdom is a female emanation. Whereas this starts to become clear is the emphasis that the Roman Church places upon Mary with respect to the doctrine of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary which mimics the resurrection of Jesus and goes beyond the role of Jesus by way of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. That she was assumed to be free from what they refer to as original sin, she would then be able to protect Jesus within her so-called sanctified womb. This flies in the face of Jesus Christ's everlasting, eternal righteousness, which is set aside by way of these two doctrines, which annul the concept of him and the Father alone possessing inherent eternal righteousness by way of relegating to Mary the role of providing protection for Jesus from taking upon himself our fallen nature and defeating it in his flesh. Whereas this is what the Bible has to say about this matter. See Hebrews chapter 2. Since then the children are sharers in flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner partook of the same, that through death he might bring not him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver all them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily not to angels doth he give help, but he giveth help to the seed of Abraham. Wherefore it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted.
Take note of verse 17, where it is stated that it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren in all things. This is clearly stating all things, not just some things. The problem is that most theologians don't accept what scripture plainly states. This verse has tremendous implications since it is basically stating that Jesus had to take upon himself our fallen nature. And by doing so, he would defeat sin in the flesh, which is the lion's mouth. Yes, Jesus would defeat sin within the lion's mouth without committing sin. Many modern-day theologians try to explain away these verses and still provide a false excuse without any theological evidence that Jesus was somehow protected. And by doing this, they give credence to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Here is another verse which is whitewashed with the belief that the likeness of sinful flesh is not sinful flesh. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What needs to be understood is the fact that the slave form is the form of fallen humanity, humanity after the fall of Adam. Adam did not have the slave form prior to his fall. So if Jesus came in the slave form of fallen humanity, this now implies that he met sin on an equal footing and defeated it. If he came with a nature like Adam's prior to the fall, then that nature could not be referred to as being a nature of the slave form. In certain instances, EGW claims that Jesus came with a pre-fallen nature. The question is, if a pre-fallen concept is different from the Immaculate Conception? Or are they saying the same thing? Granted that the Catholic teaching is much more fanciful and takes on a more occult approach, which leans toward a Kabbalistic interpretation of the role of the divine feminine. So if it behooved him in all things, this implies that he had to take upon himself our fallen nature, yet without committing sin. All things implies all things, and not just some things. This is, in fact, eternal righteousness. The fact that he could come into this world by assuming a nature like our own and defeating it within the lion's mouth. Some will say that Jesus wasn't 100% human, since this would make him a fallen sinner. And others would say that he wasn't 100% God, on account of him not being able to represent us. While these things appear to be true, or are just human explanations in reference to eternal realities, of which our minds cannot totally comprehend, the matter of not being able to account for the body that God prepared for Jesus is pretty much summed up by the experience of Job, who provided the universe with a special testimony, but in the end, he too had to repent and acknowledge God's eternal righteousness is unfathomable. 
emanations of the Kabbalah. This would later be explained within the theology of the Kabbalah, which equals 10 emanations. Proceeding from the void of the universe, which they refer to as Ein Sof, which translates as nothingness. You can click on these links and it'll open up more research. I would encourage you to please do that. It's very important. It is basically the same concept which is found in Hinduism or Buddhism, which can be referred to as pantheism, meaning that everything in the universe is an emanation from the God void. In the Kabbalah, they believe that the first three emanations from the void are the Keturah, or crown, and then Bina, a female energy, which is referred to as wisdom, and then Chakma, a male energy. So when Christians claim to have a trinity of three, the Kabbalists say they have ten emanations. This is the reason as to why all the religions of the world, minus God's true remnant church, will unite under the demonic teaching of the so-called law of one, which basically teaches that all living things, as well as inanimate things, whether physical or non-physical, come from one source, or as they say, one super consciousness. The problem with this teaching is that it will be used to explain the Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4 in an erroneous fashion, which contradicts the revelation of the two gods in the Old Testament, as well as the same revelation in John one. One. Simon Magus. Regarding the female principle called Bina, or wisdom, there was once a sorcerer by the name of Simon Magus of Samaria. See Acts. Who wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit when he witnessed the powerful miracles done by God by way of Philip one of the disciples of Jesus, who was baptizing people in Samaria. Simon was, one, was what one would call today a Gnostic. Gnosticism is a very old heresy, which can be found in many world religions and was also prevalent during the first century AD, and as a system of philosophy, was also influenced by Neoplatonism. Being similar in certain aspects, they parted ways. Yet there was a particular story about Simon Magus, which states that he acquired a consort, a local bar girl or prostitute, whose name was Helen of Tyre, and he changed her name to Sophia, which back then was another name for wisdom. Simon began touting the false teaching that Sophia was the female principle of deity. That is the reason as to certain Christian heresies teach that the Holy Spirit is feminine, and they are actually getting this teaching from Kabbalistic sources. Since when Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, he stated that it was himself coming in a distinct form of the same category of himself, yet not a totally different third person, which would be the word heteros, and Jesus never used that word. See John 14, 16. Jesus used the word alos 
not heteros, as being himself. That is the reason as to why Jesus told his disciples that they knew the Holy Spirit since they had walked and talked to him, not realizing that it was Christ himself. That is the reason as to why 2 Corinthians 3, 16-17 is so important on account of the fact that when one comes to know Jesus Christ, the veil is removed and the unveiling reveals that the Spirit is Christ himself. See John 14, 18. Conclusion 2. Both Islam and Rabbinic Judaism leave out the fact that there is a sin problem on planet Earth. And when Adam fell, by way of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he was no longer righteous and could not redeem himself in order to have eternal life. Whereas in the Garden of Eden, he and Eve had conditional immortality, which they lost upon Adam eating of this tree, thus handing over his dominion of planet Earth over to Lucifer, Satan. Fact is that both Islam and Rabbinic Judaism are devoid of a Redeemer who is eternally righteous and fulfills the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, as well as Isaiah 53, a suffering servant. The same fact about the necessity of an eternally righteous Messiah Redeemer is revealed in the book of Job, which is the oldest book of the Bible. And in Job 19.25-27, it is stated, But as for me, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin, even this body is destroyed. Then without my flesh, I shall see God, whom I, even I, shall see on my side. And mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. My heart is consumed within me. Fact is that both Islam and rabbinic Judaism stand on their own righteousness, which the Bible describes in the book of Isaiah as being filthy rags. Fact is that Jesus stated that there would be two resurrections, one of the just and the other of the unjust. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath eternal life and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour cometh and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, even so gave he to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is a son of man, Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the tomb shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. Inherent righteousness and eternal righteousness. Now notice what the book of Revelation has to say about those who claim to have inherent righteousness apart from the eternal righteousness that Jesus Christ has to offer. Here is the first resurrection, which Jesus referred to as being the resurrection of the righteous. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God, and such as worshipped not the beast, neither his image, and received not the mark upon their forehead, and upon their hand, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Here is the second resurrection of those who are devoid of Jesus Christ's righteousness. Revelation 20, the rest of the dead 
lived not until the thousand years should be finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God. and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are finished, Satan, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the war, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up over the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down out of heaven to devour them, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where are also the beast and the false prophet, and they shall never be tormented. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, even the lake of fire. And if any man was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Do you want to face God standing on your own righteousness? Your own so-called inherent righteousness? Self-righteousness? Don't think so. Revelation 20. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. After the fall of Adam, not one human being is righteous in the eyes of God. Job was the most righteous person that lived on this planet, yet at the end he became self-righteous and had to repent since he could not stand on his own righteousness when he witnessed the power and glory of God and was not able to answer the questions that God had presented to him since he believed that he was justified by his own righteousness in the presence of God. This is what Job has to say today to Muslims and Jews who stand on their own righteousness. Then Job answered Yahweh and said, I know that thou canst do all things, and that no purpose of thine can be restrained. Who is this that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that which I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And it was so that after Yahweh had spoken these words unto Job, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is... kindled against thee and against thy two friends for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant job hath now therefore take unto thee you seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant job shall pray for you for him will i accept that i deal not with you after your folly for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. 
So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as Yahweh commanded them. And Yahweh accepted Job. And Yahweh turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And Yahweh gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job stated the following after his repentance and self-righteousness. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin, even this body is destroyed. Then without my flesh shall I see God, whom I, even I, shall see on my side, and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. My heart is consumed within me. Neither Islam nor Judaism are able to explain this paradox of the righteousness of God by way of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And the two scenarios of Alpha and Omega, as well as the duality of God in John 1.1, 1, 1, as well as the Old Testament revelation of the identity of the angel of the Lord, which was Christ himself, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 5. Their one God theology is at a complete loss to reveal the true nature of God, which is a duality. Whereas the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 1, God, having of old time spoken unto the fathers and the prophets by diverse portions and in diverse manners, hath at the end of these days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed, appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the effulgence of his glory and the very image of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What the Apostle Paul is basically stating is the fact that from hindsight meaning, that from the Omega scenario, going back in time, Jesus Christ is identified by the concept of sonship and was in fact the same personage who created all things in the Alpha scenario, which was all prior to the sonship of the human genetics scenario, known as the Omega, whose biblical definition is of the seed of David. Strict monotheism runs into major problems in Exodus 23, 21. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee by the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Take ye heed before him and hearken unto his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Notice that this angel can pardon sin, and according to the Old and New Testament, only God can forgive sin. Later, the Apostle Paul with elaborate, will elaborate on that statement by identifying this angel as Christ himself prior to the Incarnation. Now Exodus 23:21 is very interesting since it proves that there are in fact two Yahwehs as stated in Isaiah 44:6. And we have seen that Exodus 23:21 states that the name of the invisible God resides within the bosom or heart of the angel of the Lord. This is also mentioned in the New Testament of the Son 
being in the bosom of the Father. But the way it is interpreted by Christians is also erroneous, since in the pre-incarnate scenario of the Alpha, as stated by Jesus himself in Revelation 22, 13-16, there was no sonship, but only the root of David alongside the eternal Father, number one. The term, the root of David, is another name for the Messiah. Being pre-existent before King David, as stated by Jesus when he explained Psalms 110, 1 to 4, and called the Messiah David's Lord. This is where we come to Mark 12. Jesus clearly revealed this matter in Mark 12, where the initial conversation was based on the matter of the one God. And one of the religious leaders spoke up and told Jesus that he was right and that God was to be loved with our whole soul, heart, mind, and strength. It says, and one of the scribes came and heard them questioning together and knowing that he was answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This, the second is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, of a truth, teacher, thou hast well said that he is one, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not, not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Now notice what Jesus told the scribe. He told them that he wasn't far from the kingdom of God. But he didn't say that the scribe had arrived at the kingdom of God. In the following verses, notice where Jesus takes the conversation, which was previously about the one God. So here we go. And Jesus answered and said, as he taught in the temple, How say the scribes? that the Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, is the son of David. David himself said in the Holy Spirit. So how can the scribe say that Christ is, the, is David's son? Didn't David say that the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet? David himself calleth him Lord. And whence? Is he his son? And the common people heard him gladly. These common people rejoiced and had arrived at the kingdom of God on account of the recognition of the duality of Psalm 110.4, where David's Lord was seen as being the Messiah, which to all intents and purposes was eternal father number two, whose name was Melchizedek, as stated by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 7, 1 to 3. What is not properly understood is the following. Why was the transcendent Messiah of Psalms 110, 1-4, who was prior to David, referred to as being of the order of Melchizedek. The answer to that question is in respect to both the Alpha and Omega scenarios, where Christ prior to the Incarnation 
is purely God and is actually eternal father number two and was known by Paul to be Melchizedek, the priest of God, which was Christ prior to the incarnation. Of Melchizedek, Paul stated the following. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham divided a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth priest continually. So this eternally transcendent being known as Melchizedek, the Logos of John 1, 1, who was present in beginning and was with God or alongside God and was also God. There were two individual separate singular beings and not a compound unity or a trinity or just one singular being. Nor is it binitarianism, two in one substance. John 1.1 1, 1 is very clear in reference to numerical definition, which in this case, it's two gods, as in Revelation 22.1, the throne of God and the Lamb. In Revelation 5, it is stated that this Lamb is the root of David. meaning the Alpha scenario, and is also of the Omega scenario, which is the offspring of David. So when you hear root of David, that's Alpha. When you hear offspring, that's Omega. Once we establish the roles of these two scenarios, of eternally transcendent Godhood, and later sonship, we can then proceed to understand the reasons as to why Melchizedek, being the same individual, Christ, is also referred to as being of the order of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek falls under the category of sonship. So he's Melchizedek and the Alpha and then the Omega. The order of Melchizedek, the category of sonship. When Melchizedek, aka Christ, took upon himself our humanity, he had to overcome. And once he overcame sin in the human form, where the first Adam had failed, he then qualified to be our great high priest of the order of Melchizedek, which comes under the category of sonship, as stated in Hebrews 5. For every high priest being taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can bear gently with the ignorant and erring. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, this is speaking of the high priest on here on earth. And by reason thereof is bound, and for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh the honor un unto himself, but when he is called of God, even as was Aaron. So Christ also glorified him, not himself, to be made a high priest. But he that spake unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, having offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying, 
and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and having been heard for his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him the author of eternal salvation, named of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There you have it. So that's part two, and we actually we went over a little bit, but that will that will work out just fine. So we don't have to s split the parts up into too many videos. So next will be part three: ushering eternal righteousness, the alpha scenario of two eternal tr eternally transcendent beings. Part three. So stay tuned and. Uh, wait for the next video. God bless.